Okay, you're live. Great. Good evening, my name is Linda Gorski and I'm the president of the Houston Archaeological Society and I'd like to welcome you to our program tonight. Um, we have a great meeting for you tonight uh, presented by Steve Stoudemire of the uh, Hill Country Archaeological Association on 41KR754, a new multi-component site containing late Paleo-Indian through late prehistoric assemblages in Kerr County, Texas. He's also gonna talk about the site that we're going to be digging at field school this year. Um, I got a preview of this talk last night and I think you're going to really enjoy it. Uh, Steve is a retired petroleum engineer. He received a BA in anthropology from Florida State University and an MS in geology from Texas Tech. During his 32 year career in the petroleum industry, he held technical business and managerial positions in both domestic and international operations. Since retirement in 2007, he and his wife, Nancy, have lived near Kerrville, Texas. He is an active avocational archeologist and regularly works to educate the public through teaching classes and giving archeology span lectures. He works with private landowners by their invitation to help them understand archeological sites on their property. He is also a member, past president, and current field committee chairman of the Hill Country Archaeological Association, a member of the Texas Archaeological Society, the Galt School of Archaeological Research, and the Center for the Study of First Americans. He also serves as vice chairman of the board of the Galt School at the University of Texas, Austin, and as a Texas archaeological steward for the Texas Historical Commission. Steve is also one of the people in charge of field school this year, so some of us will see him quite frequently in the next couple of weeks. Steve, you're on. Okay. All right. Thank you, Linda, for that. Very nice introduction that I wrote for you. <laughs> uh, I, uh, yeah, the first thing that I'm going to talk about tonight is, is this um, really interesting, it just keeps getting better kind of a, an archaeological site that uh, we've at least gotten back to late paleo and it's everything in between to really too historic. Uh, because there's an old road that goes through the site or near the site. And so the late second half of the 1800s when Kerr County and surrounding areas were getting settled, um, there was traffic along that road from, from uh, Kerrville out to, uh, to Rock Springs. But, but what I'm gonna talk about tonight are the, uh, <clears throat> the Native American uh, cultural aspects of the site. And it is, um, as you can see, on the map, we call it the CWR site. That stands for Crying Woman Ranch site. It's recorded as 41KR754. Um, we were contacted by the owners of this uh, area, this site, uh, who own about a 110 acre ranch by way of our website. Um, just a, absolutely the best kind of people you could hope for to own property that you want to do archeology span on there. They're fantastic stewards of the property and of the archaeology. And a couple of our, our folks went out early to talk to the owner, <clears throat> told him uh, what our organization could do and um, that we could help them understand their site, et cetera. Uh, and the owner and his wife were very, um, very encouraging about wanting us to do everything we could to help them understand the archeology span on their side. In fact, they, they even said what they're planning on doing is building, uh, actually not building, renovating a, an old log cabin that is on their ranch that is about uh, 1890s to 1900 vintage. And they're gonna put basically a history center in it for neighbors, friends, family, et cetera. And so the more that they could learn about this, this site, uh, the more that they can put in there. And so that's one of the things that we're helping them with. Um, as I'm sure that the Houston Society does, we always tell landowners we don't like to excavate unless we 
have a really good reason to, because once you excavate, even if you keep perfect records, uh, you still destroy the site. But these, these uh, landowners were really adamant about wanting to learn everything that they could. So we decided to go ahead with that. Um, initially, just surface traverses. There was an awful lot of archeology span on it. This, there's archeology span all over their ranch, but the, the key part is the site I'm gonna speak of, and that's down by the river. So it's on a river terrace. And at first glance, it just looks like a typical Central Texas midden site. But as we began um, excavations, we began to find things that were not very common, uh, such as bison, bison uh, remains and, and other things, including uh, items that were clearly trade items, not native to the area, which had to have been brought in by, uh, by Native Americans. And we'll talk about all of this in a little more detail later on in the presentation. Um, but you can see there in that fourth bullet point down, some of those, some of those trade items. There are some uncommon tools, such as base tang and shaft straighteners. And, um, and then the projectile point assembly, at least to date, uh, really dates from the um, middle to late Paleo Indian. It depends on which archaeologist you really talk to, but um, 10,250 to 400 BP approximately. And there's, there's culture all between those dates. So this was a site that was repeatedly occupied throughout, uh, throughout the millennia. It's got all the makings of things that, uh, that Native Americans would have wanted to have. Um, it's this time period here. Uh, like I said, there's a little bit of historic in there. Uh, things such as square nails and, and Spencer carbine uh, shell casings, uh, 4570, caliber of shell casings, um, belt buckles, and, and several other things. I think we found a, a horseshoe or two in there. So it was along the, the old road, obviously, where people were camping and just dropping things in historic times. Uh, this is a shot down the river, and the site is on the right. You can't see much about it, except it's just gorgeous. I mean, it's a beautiful area if you've got to do uh, if you've got to do dirt work, this is the place to do it. Uh, it's just really a, a really nice area. It's fairly remote. Um, this is a, a map of the site, and uh, you can see the, the, the topographic contours there are in feet. And some of the, the pieces of the site, like the middens, which are the dark circles or oblong circles, and then the excavation units that we have today are the squares or, or rectangles. That uh, little dashed circle there kind of in the middle is, a, is an excavation pit that the, the owner dug for a water tank. And, um, and then we've got cliffs right on the southern side of the site, which vary from anywhere from 40 to, to 60 to 70 feet in height. Now, what I'm going to do next is, is show you the the real general basic stratigraphy of the site. And I say that because we don't have enough deep subsurface control points to really get uh, too precise about this. But uh, if you'll look now at the cross section with A at the bottom and B at the top or on the right, uh, this is what you would see. And this is vertically exaggerated seven, seven times. And so looking to the stream on the right, you'll see a terrace that's called the latest Holocene Terrace. That's a terrace that's built up likely just within the last few hundred years. And um, that's the T0 Terrace. The next terrace in age, as we go backward in time, is the T1 Terrace, which is mid-late Holocene. And then underneath it, uh, for most of the area, except the left part of it, where you see that U9, which is a unit nine um, excavation penetration, it actually outcrops. And that terrace is, uh, is where we found the paleo. So um, this is very simplified. I'm sure it's quite a bit more complicated, but we just don't have the control at this point to, to really figure that out. 
When we started the excavation, we started around this larger midden. Um, those, um, those units there, which are combinations of square meter uh, units, uh, were, were where we started. And that's where we begin finding really a very rich assemblage of different things. Um, those shovel tests in the, in the red uh, circles are very recent. In fact, just in the last uh, month, a month and a half, month and a half have we put those down. The other units on there, you can see there's units down there in the gray shaded region, which is where that, uh, that oldest uh, T2 terrace actually outcrops. This is a shot of very early excavations. Um, we, we had already at this point encountered uh, fire crack rock, limestone fire crack rock, hearths. And within that hearth and around that hearth, actually it's probably two or three hearths that, that uh, merged together, uh, we found the remains of, uh, of the modern buffalo, bison, bison. We also found in association with those buffalo bones, uh, the dark points, the Montel and the Castroville, which are typical late archaic uh, dark points. Now I'm using generally the temporal spans of the the uh, Turner Hester stone artifacts of Texas Indians artifacts. I know, I mean, uh, temporal spans. I know that uh, there's been reworks of the temporal spans, uh, uh, and uh, I'm just using something I think everybody is familiar with here. But um, in, in addition to the bison bones, we found what you would expect uh, for this time period: white-tailed deer, uh, some small mammals, and so and so forth. <clears throat> this is uh, just some of the points from that archaic area, starting in the lower right, you see the um, early archaic uh, forms, and then uh, clockwise, middle archaic, Tip typical pedernalis, um, or as some people out here say, pedernalis. I've never found that R in the first syllable, but it's aptly there with some people. And... Uh, and then the transitional archaic, late archaic in the upper right, there's a, there's a Montel and a Castroville there on the, on the uh, far right of that upper right frame. And then finally over to the, to the true air points with uh, Toya, Toya phase of Perdiz points and, um, and an Edwards point there, uh, Austin phase. This is just the archaic late prehistoric point tally. So you can see there is a preponderance of Perdiz points. Uh, associated with the Perdiz points, we found pottery, several varieties of pottery, which we will look at in just a moment. And the typical uh, tool assemblage that would go with archaic, archaic and late prehistoric uh, central Texas sites, scrapers utilized modified flakes, Base tang's a little unusual, shaft straighteners a little unusual, but monos, choppers, and, and shirt knives, of course, and drills are very, very common. Some of the faunal remains that are a little bit unique. Uh, first on the left, there's a, a lower, uh, lower canine on the far left and a lower molar, which actually was from the same mandible, but the mandible was so deteriorate, deteriorated that we could not save it. Uh, whether it's domestic dog or wolf or coyote, it's just impossible to say with just these teeth. If you have a complete skull, that's one thing, but, uh, but we've only got these teeth. Uh, I, wanna, I would like to believe that it's, it's, uh, it's Canis familiaris, the, uh, the domestic dog. We do have a, uh, a cemetery site in this part of, of Kerr County that is called the Bering Sinkhole, and there's a... Um, uh, it was excavated and, and analyzed by University of Texas beginning in the 1970s. And um, they found, I think, five or seven um, skeletons of domestic dogs interred with the, uh, with the human skeletons, which they calculated 63 human skeletons uh, in that uh, particular sinkhole. And that only a part of it was, was excavated. The bones on the the right are as near as we can tell bird and large bird 
and they most favorably compare to wild turkey. Now, we've got some osteological collections here, and, uh, and these most closely resemble, even though the distal ends are, are broken, the general form of the bones resemble the um, radius and ulna of wild turkey. And then, of course, the bison bison. Whether there's antelope there or not, I mean, these are, you know, antelope um, dentition and bones are very similar to, to white-tailed deer. Uh, it's probably not likely that they were there at this particular point in, in, in history, but, but they could have been. Now, these are some of the trade items. And uh, right up front, I just want to, I, I saw that Dub is, is part of the audience. So Dub really helped me out here with, uh, since we're both geologists, but he's a mineralogical expert and I am not. And he helped me to identify one of the, one of the possible sources of that upper left um, set of artifacts, which are clear quartz crystal flakes that have actually been worked. And um, according to Dub, it could have come from the Eastern uh, Llano uh, Central Mineral Region, or they could have come from the Washita Mountains of Arkansas, where you get those big, beautiful, uh, clear quartz crystals that everybody wants to put on their, uh, their mantelpiece. The percussion flakes of vein quartz on the upper right are very common. Those could have easily come from vein quartz in the granites, uh, just 60 miles uh, northwest, sort of northeast of Kerrville in the central mineral region. Uh, the pottery there, that's just a few shirts with fingernail imprints. We had uh, uh, Dr. Tim Perchula looked at all the pottery and identified all of it. Um, there was quite a bit of it that was Caddo. But the real prize of the whole group of the obsidian flakes, these are real cultural flakes. They had to have come off of an of a obsidian core. And we sent these flakes to a special lab in Missouri. I can't remember the name of the lab, but they're able to type the, the, the cultural flake or, or piece back to the um, obsidian outcrop. In this case, it was Malad, Idaho. Now, just kind of, it's, it's really just interesting to think about how many different trade exchanges along a trade route that was over a thousand miles long took place and how long that took to get that obsidian core or cores from Malad to this site. Now we were rollicking along real nice in the archaic and late prehistoric and then everything changed and it changed by what all of us we get so excited about, and that is an unexpected discovery. And in this case, it was a waterline ditch that uh, you see there in Red Dash that the owner had dug over the weekend. And then when we arrived on a Monday morning, which is our typical day to go out there and, and excavate, um, we noticed that there was a ditch. It was it looked like that. You could see the soil heat that came out of the ditch. And um, one of our members, who I think is in the audience, uh, Craig Mangum, uh, left the archaic area and walked over there and looked at it. And the first thing he noticed was the soil color was different. Now, this, this area out here has got a lot of grass on it and a lot of uh, tree leaves. There's quite a bit of trees around. And so you couldn't really see the surface color of the soil unless you were in one of our excavation units. He noticed this, the, the um, color of the soil had changed. And then right there where that, that white arrow is, he found this. That's the front and back of a St. Mary's Hall Paleo-Indian point. I can remember it very vividly. Craig walked back over to the group in the archaic units and he said, you know, you guys got to look at this. And we did. And the first thing we did was pull out the, uh, uh, the Turner Hester um, book on stone artifacts, and we concluded it was a St. Mary's Hall. Now, you can see with the flaking pattern, there's a distinct uh, characteristic of St. Mary's Hall points, and that is that uh, parallel oblique flaking that, that goes across the entire face, generally, of St. Mary's Hall points. Um, so that changed everything. Uh, we we actually stopped the uh, 
excavations in the uh, archaic, and we moved over to uh, to this outcrop of the what what we're now calling the T2 uh, terrace, and we put in some units there, and uh, you can see where that first St. Mary's was found, and uh, to date. Now we have found uh, 22 St. Mary's Hall, 19 of which were in the subsurface of those two, two uh, unit groups where the arrow is. Uh, and also there was a, um, there were two Angostura points that was, you know, one was in the subsurface and one was at the surface right there at those, uh, those two unit groups. That far left uh, unit, um, we haven't, we haven't uh, excavated it in in for a while. We did find a, an Angus, Angostura subsurface and one on the surface, but things were too exciting over there where, where all the St. Mary's halls were being found. Now I gotta tell you a real quick story about Craig because Craig has been a loyal, dedicated member of our association for a long time and he'll, he'll just do whatever needs to be done and he likes to dig though. And uh, when we were, when we were and we still are excavating, the last couple of months, there's a pattern that's emerged. And that is, uh, Craig will be excavating in one of the paleo units in one part of the unit. And another member of our group, Ed Mendon, will be excavating in another part. Craig will stop, get up to do something, go over and check out the archaic units and tell Ed, we'll, Come on over here and excavate my, my area if you want to. Ed will go over there and Ed will immediately find another St. Mary's Hall, probably a couple of centimeters just below where Craig was, was traveling last. And that has happened several times, not just with St. Mary's Hall, but with a, recently with a drill, a St. Mary's Hall drill that had been uh, resharpened, sorry, a St. Mary's Hall point that had been resharpened into a drill. So uh, we like to tease Craig a lot about uh, letting Ed find all the points, and he's very good natured about it. But I'm sure you guys in the Houston group have all these kind of fun experiences too. But we we certainly do with our folks. The St. Mary's Hall form uh, is it's not extremely unique, but it does have a limited range in Central Texas, and um, it wasn't actually first described in the literature until 1998 by uh, Susan Dial and Ann Kerr when they found specimens at the Wilson Leonard site. The point form had actually been found near the St. Mary's Hall Academy in Northern San Antonio from field work in 1974 and 1977. At the time, there was no such thing as a St. Mary's Hall point. And so the archeologist at that time uh, deemed it closest to a plain view, and that's what they called it. But once it was found in, Saint, in, in Wilson Leonard and really uh, Susan Dahl and Ann Kerr, probably in consultation with Tom Hester, since he's a, he's a guru of St. Mary's Hall points, um, decided, well, this is, this is the form that you found at St. Mary's Hall Academy, so that's what we're going to call this new point. form. It is a very delicate point form, it's very thin, uh, 0.4 to 0.6 centimeters thick. Typically, it's not that long, up to nine centimeters. Uh, you can see some illustrations down there from Turner Hester and also from Hester's latest uh, publication, 2017 on St. Mary's Hall points. Now, I, wanna, I want to indicate, if you can see my red cursor, these points here exhibit an upper right to lower left flaking pattern. All of these here and here. This one is exactly opposite. These are the minority in the St. Mary's Hall uh, point population in Texas, according to Dr. Hester. I said, put a percentage on it, Tom. And he said, probably 5% of the hundreds of St. Mary's I've seen are this, um, this abnormal upper left to lower right. At the, at the Kerr County site, almost all of the points are this atypical upper left to lower right form. 
This form here is the one that Craig found. You can clearly see in the upper right uh, that oblique flaking, uh, upper left, the lower right. Same here. The point in the lower right is pretty beat up, but um, you'll just have to take my word for it. When you can, when you really get in the right light, you can see it's the uh, it's the common form of uh, upper right to lower left. But the significance of this point is that it was very closely associated with bone in the in the paleo units, which we had dated by beta analytic of Miami, and you can see the calibrated date there of 10,248 to 10,193. These are some of the others. This is not all of them, obviously. We just picked the, obviously the best ones to show you. Uh, and um, this, this one here in the middle is uh, an upper right to lower left on the left frame side. And on the right frame, it's an upper Sorry, it's an upper right to lower left. In, the, in the, the right frame, it's really an upper left to lower right. So it's got a different flake pattern on each side. Now, according to Tom Hester, he's never seen one like this with a different flake, different oblique flaking pattern uh, on each side. This one here, and all of these uh, points are the same scale. So it's an apple to apple comparison as far as size. When we found this one, it was just a few weeks ago. Uh, we didn't think it was St. Mary's. We thought it was something else. Uh, but um, as we have done with all of these specimens, uh, we've involved Tom Hester, and he, he confirmed that it was uh, really a St. Mary's Hall point. Uh, I didn't have enough room to put all both sides for this point in there, but there's, there's some oblique flaking you can see and some other characteristics. Now, this is in one of the paleo units. Uh, this is several months back, and we're excavating right next to a large pecan tree, uh, which that's the tree root of. Uh, we didn't want to cut the tree root and kill the owner's pecan tree, so that would not have been very good for our future archaeological endeavors out there. Um, I wish I had a better picture of the way it was then, but this rock, large limestone rock we we found again excavating around it pedestal down uh, under it and just felt like you know that maybe there's something under there and that's what was under there directly in contact with the, the limestone rock so um as as carefully as that looks uh it perhaps was cached there A little deeper down, we found this drill. It's probably a reworked St. Mary's Hall point, uh, but it, it's been so resharpened that we cannot call it that. It's just, it just doesn't have any of the, certainly you can't see oblique flaking, you can't see any of the uh, vertical flaking that emanates from the concave base uh, towards the, the medial portion. But it is a beautiful base, or sorry, a beautiful uh, perforator and um, a drill rather, and it was lying right on top of two bone fragments, which just from a size standpoint uh, are probably deer. Uh, very thin bone, but big enough to be uh, something like a femur or humerus of a, of a white-tailed deer. Now, I just mentioned the Angus stewards because they are paleo, although some archeologists would, would just include them as the very earliest part of the early archaic. But um, the illustrations to your left are from, from uh, Turner Hester. And um, <clears throat> the points on the right are the bases and medial portion of uh, four Angostoras. For instance, the B and the B prime are the same point, just different sides and so forth. So that's the total tally as of May 1. 22 St. Mary's, and then we also found another uh, tool. It's, it's, not, uh, it's not rare, but it's not real common, particularly in, in uh, paleo sites, but uh, clear fork tools in the paleo-Indian levels, in those paleo-Indian units. 
uh, several, at, at least three. I, I'd have to go back in our records and, and see if there's any more, but I'm, I'm certain there's three. This is a view, plan view of these main paleo units. Um, the red dots are, are where the, the St. Mary's were found in the units. And then that first St. Mary's that Craig found is right there by the water, was right, right there by the waterline ditch. The owner actually came out in a spoil and found a spoil, uh, found a St. Mary's in a spoil heap by that same ditch. Uh, maybe a month later after Craig found his. And then there was one other surface St. Mary's that was found over here on the right. But all of the rest, uh, all 19 of the rest are, uh, are from the subsurface. Let's take the waterline ditch out and I want you to focus on the A to B cross section because what we're gonna do is we're gonna look at the vertical context of these points. So where they are, uh, in plan view, in a in a right angle projection into the uh, cross section line, they would look like this. So they're very fairly tightly grouped in the units nine, eleven, and fourteen, and they're not as as uh, tightly grouped in units thirteen, fifteen, and sixteen. And there's a caliche zone that. Uh, that it's it's uh, it's it's a little beyond early stage Caliche, Caliche development, but it is there, and um, and all of almost all of these points are within that Caliche zone. Of course, that developed in the soil, just pure pure soil chemistry. Uh, the the dated bone that I mentioned earlier was found there with the blue uh, symbol. And uh, there were three pieces. The upper piece uh, compares most favorably, favorably to the rear uh, mandible. Uh, and the lower pieces compare most favorably to either humerus or femur uh, fragments. Uh, the, the bone is very thick walled. So it, uh, it's not deer. Uh, it is most likely buffalo. Um, We've got, as I said, we have, we have skeletons that we do our osteological comparisons with, and that's what it most closely resembles. And of course, with the date on it, that would suggest that it's either, either bison antiquus or bison occidentalis. Uh, antiquus in its evolutionary um, life was, a, was about to fizz out around 10,000. Um, and uh, occidentalis was, which is, I think, considered by, by many to be a direct uh, directly in the evolutionary line uh, from Antiquus, but Octodentalis was just getting started in its evolutionary life uh, around 10,500. <clears throat> so it could be either one of those, those two buffalo, if indeed it is buffalo. Now this is, um, is, is the group of units that um, was to the left on an earlier slide. And this is showing uh, limestone firecrack rock at one particular level. Um, we encountered the first firecrack rocks in these units, 13, 15, and 16, just a few centimeters below surface. <clears throat> um, some of the charcoal we sent to Dr. Leslie Bush, who identified it as oak family, but she couldn't get it any further down uh, below family level. Uh, we tried dating some of the charcoal that literally was right underneath some of the firecrack rock. Uh, we sent it to a direct AMS in Washington. Uh, it did not survive pretreatment. It just was too deteriorated. We also had some bone. Actually, it's quite a bit of bone out of this, this hearth cluster. And, um, and the bone was too mineralized. So we were very lucky on that um, on that bone there in units uh, 9, 11, and 14 to have gotten a date, uh, whereas uh, we were very unlucky uh, here getting a date from bone. There is bone from uh, buffalo-sized animals, uh, a deer, several deer, uh, either molars or fragments of different bones. They're small mammals. There's something on the order of a, uh, uh, 
an oversized raccoon or an undersized dog, but it's a very worn mandible with molars in it. That it's a very, very mature animal uh, with a with a large um, uh, large uh, canine on its uh, on, on the lower jaw. Um, but it's, it was too mineralized also today. So we don't think that this was a hearth for plant baking. And of course, plant baking really, really got started, as you all know, uh, in this part of the world, in, in, uh, in the archaic and particularly the middle archaic. But uh, uh, we, we see so much bone remains here that it's just obvious that they were, they were cooking meat here. Now let's take another look at this group of units, uh, 13, 16, and 15 that's on your left. We're gonna look at another cross section and we're gonna look at a plot in of all the firecrack rock uh, in that group of units. So, oops, I went a little too far. So there's the, there's the firecrack rock plotted in. It's obviously more than one hearth. Uh, this might be one hearth here. Uh, this might be one hearth here. It's just really difficult to tell, but you can see we're we're at about 10 centimeters below ground level, and it's all the way almost to a meter below ground level. So it was uh, it was likely uh, several different occupations uh, that uh, that were buried by river sediments, and uh, and then Native Americans built built cooking hearths on top of the same area. Uh, this is where the St. Mary's spot in. And that is the drill, the rework drill that I mentioned earlier. That's the very last thing that we found. Actually, that's another Craig and Ed story because uh, Ed found those right next to where Craig was working and Craig still kept his sense of humor. But, but enough of the base is there that you can, uh, with the thickness, and some other attributes that it's, uh, we feel pretty comfortable uh, in identifying it as a St. Mary's Hall. Now, I expect that many of you, maybe all of you have seen uh, firecrack rock, firecrack limestone rock, uh, but this is what the, the firecrack rock looked like out of that cluster of, of rocks that I just showed you. They are generally still large. Uh, you can see when, when I broke them open with my geological hammer, we get what you typically get, and that is a slight sulfur smell, and then a, a discoloration of gray to dark gray uh, in the rocks themselves. <clears throat> a lot of these rocks had not even cracked from the fire. They were still, they looked very natural. And uh, you can see some of these down here, some of the larger rocks and then some of the smaller rocks. Um, and I won't, I won't go through the, the iterations of, of just calculating gross cooking episodes that Texas State University, uh, Steve Black, uh, Charles Conning, his grad student, was his grad student, uh, came up with a formula, an algorithm really, to, uh, to calculate gross cooking episodes from, from utilizing uh, experimental, modern experimental archaeology uh, to, um, to look at the different uh, rock sizes in, in hearths or middens, but uh, um, we did a rough calculation using that algorithm, and there was, in this entire group of hearths, uh, we came up with a, um, a gross cooking episode number of nine with a standard deviation of five. So, and that makes sense because most of these rocks are still pretty large. The, these are the, the unusual size here. They're, they've obviously been uh, several cooking episodes to break those up into that smaller size as opposed to almost no cooking episodes to break these larger ones up. This primarily is from the 2017 uh, Hester publication where he was trying to summarize all of the St. Mary's Hall sites uh, that he knew of that had either been published or that he knew of. And, uh, but we've added a few things to it with his concurrence. And of course, one is the County site or with 22 uh, St. Mary's Halls. Uh, the uh, San Antonio site there that's got the green and two stars is the site that uh, Steve Tonka and his crews worked, I think, around 2005. 
And uh, they actually got a C-14 date on some bone. And uh, that was a 10,500 calibrated date. Um, and those are the two dates, as I mentioned earlier, that uh, that date and, and our date uh, in the Kerr County site that, that uh, at least Hester considers to be the only real um, valid dates in good context with, with St. Mary's Hall. And then finally, um, the red circle uh, is from the Turner Hester book of the St. Mary's Hall range. Uh, I put the Long Oak site on there. I kind of guessed it where it was. Well, no, I didn't. I looked at that site. So it's a, I think that's about where it is. Uh, but there's another site that, um, that appears to be up uh, north in North Texas, and that's the, what's called the Trinity River site. It's an inactive site. But the, our president, um, Mike McBride, I don't know if he got into the audience late or not, but Mike lived in Dallas, worked in Dallas for a long time, uh, was president of the Dallas Archaeological uh, Society, and, and he worked the site and recovered a few points and fragments of points there that he, that he took with him. Um, he didn't really think much about them until we found this um, Kirk County site with the St. Mary's Hall points in it. Once he did, once he began looking at that again, he pulled the points out, looked at them, had Tom Hester look at them. Sure enough, Hester said, these are, these are St. Mary's Hall points. So um, just one site, just, uh, just a few fragments, not a complete point, but uh, apparently the, the St. Mary's Hall range is a little, little bit more than, than what, uh, what the Hester Turner book showed it to be. And then finally, um, there's no need for a summary. We're just going to do that. We're just going to dig deeper and uh, dig more of it. The owners are great. They are going to let us work as long as we want to, as long as we don't kill any pecan trees. And, um, and so we, we feel like we've got a really rare opportunity here to, to help add more to the knowledge uh, of, of paleo in, in Texas. I've got uh, a variety of names there that have helped us out, including Dub there. And, and other, uh, in, in addition to Dub, members from other uh, Texas archaeological societies also who have been out there. So we thank you all, and we're looking forward to, to more excavations. And by the way, if you do come to the field school, um, we are going to take a limited tour for a, a, a limited group. It's probably going to be no more than 20 people. There's 20 that show up and sign up for it uh, that we will actually take out to this paleo site and show them the, uh, the excavation works out there. So that I believe is, yeah, that's the last uh, slide of the, uh, of the uh, 754 site. And uh, Linda, you tell me if we should stop now and take questions or you want me to go ahead and finish the talk with talking about the field school. Why don't you go ahead and talk about the field school and then we could have questions afterwards. Is that okay? Because your you're talk That's about fine. the field school is gonna be pretty quick, right? Right. Okay. All right, so that is just a control backhoe trench early on in the excavations actually through one of the middens. Uh, this is on a real broad river terrace uh, and it's very close to Kerrville. And we this, call it the Bear Creek Ranch Complex or the Kimosabi Complex. When we first started working it, we recorded three sites there because we thought they were all separate. The more we worked it, we realized they were all contiguous and merged. So it's really just one big site on 88 acres. And um, it is, uh, like I said, it's just outside the city limits. Uh, the Hill Country Archaeology Association started working in 2013. One of our members, Marvin Golke, is the owner. He is a Texas uh, archaeology steward also, and he will be somebody that you see out there if you come to the field school. Um, the site consists of several middens, four actually, that we identified. Other firecrack rock scatters, uh, lithic scatters. There's discrete firecrack rock hearths in the subsurface, and there's borrow and oven pits. Uh, the diagnostics that we found out there are everything from early archaic through transitional archaic with, 
with the Perdiz point, which is Toyophase late prehistoric, it was found on the surface. And there is a questionable Paleo-Indian base that's been found. Uh, we've gotten several uh, carbon-14 dates from out there, but the oldest one associated with culture is the 7420-7280 uh, calibrated BP date that you see there. This is the way it sets up. That's the Guadalupe River in the upper part. Uh, it is um, the, the, the headline site prior to the Bear Creek Ranch was the Gatlin site. Uh, it was uh, 41KR621 accidentally discovered when they were prepping, when the TxDOT was prepping to build uh, Highway 98. Um, between um, the TxDOT folks, uh, they realized with some uh, borehole testing and other things that there was likely a rich archeological site there. And so they stopped all road operations and called in SWCA, who excavated for seven months, finishing up in 2004. And then there was three years of analysis by multiple disciplines before the first publications on the site in 2008. It was hailed as one of the most significant early mid-archaic sites ever found in Central Texas. The thing about Gatlin is it was a lot of stuff that was found, but they found an awful lot of different projectile points that were in association with datable material, principally charcoal. So they were able to, with that dating, help to understand the temporal spans of uh, many of these, uh, particularly middle archaic and early archaic points. Now, from a standpoint of, of occupations and culture, we're probably very similar at the Bear Creek Ranch, Kimasabi. Um, very, very similar. And the sites are only six tenths of a mile apart. Uh, this is just at a point in the earlier operations when it looked like there were several sites. But by and large, the most activity and the ones where all the excavations or the field school will be it, or where my red cursor is, is uh, traversing there. In the, uh, and then that's where the four middens are. That's where all of the excavations that the Hill Country Archaeology Association has done uh, exist. Just a quick temporal span to show you the different point forms and where they show up. I think we've got a total of about 22 different point forms. Uh, early archaic. Uh, and this is the paleo, which Elton Pruitt says is paleo, um, but it's a base and he couldn't get past paleo. So I'm not sure what, what paleo it is, but um, these, are, these are just kind of typical points found in the early archaic, except this guy right here in the upper left. And, um, and that's kind of an unusual point, but um, I think we found two or three of those all together. Middle archaic, very typical. Uh, and then uh, late archaic and transitional archaic, some of those are very, very typical. And the one for these era point. Um, as far as features, there's 15 of those uh, discrete uh, firecrack rock hearths. Uh, there's a re really odd teardrop shaped cluster of rounded stones, which we we're just guessing we're boiling stones, but they, they don't look like anything else out there. Uh, bar pits were just a few, and, uh, and uh, when there was a pit that you could discern, there were no firecrack rock in it. Uh, some burned soil, and then the burned rock middens, which total four. Uh, this is one of those discrete firecrack rock hearths in the early archaic sediments. And this is another one. And in this one, we had a bandy point that you can see was under this uh, or near this rock here. And that's a larger photo of it. And, uh, and then we got a good charcoal sample down here in the bottom of that cluster of firecrack rock. These are apparently all associated because they were all exactly the same stratigraphic level, almost identical in centimeters below ground level at this point. So we feel like it was just a, a hearth that's somewhat disturbed, but it was good enough to give us that charcoal uh, for that date. So we're, we were very glad to get that. And I think that's all.
Oh, so I thank you for your patience. Steve, that was a fabulous talk. Just, just fabulous. Liz, are you there? Thank Do you. we have any questions? Yes, there's some in our chat, actually. Uh, Whit Wittenmeyer is asking about what some theories might be about that upper left to lower right pattern uh, on those St. Mary Hall points. And my question is, is it coincidental that 10% of the population is left-handed and that Hester's sample is 5% aberrant? Well, that's a, that's a very good comparison. And we've certainly had those discussions with, with Hester, but uh, um, I don't know that it's that simple because um, we've got one, one gentleman in our group, this is Mike McBride, who is the president, and he's an expert napper. He's been doing napping for 30 years, and he, he's a right-handed guy, and he was able to make an upper left to lower right pattern just as easily as he was to make a upper uh, left to lower right, vice versa. So I'm not sure that left-handedness was the cause of the difference in pattern. But, but what's really unusual is, it, you know, either, either there was one napper at the site that produced all of those points and he tended to, he or she tended to make them upper left to lower right or, or not. But we, you know, it's one of those questions for the ages that we probably will never know. And then there was a, also a question, um, again, from Wittenmeyer about the molar that could have been a tamed dog. Uh, wondering if there's any way to do any sort of lab testing that could make any further determinations of that, of that uh, molar. Well, uh, you know, a real expert uh, osteologist might be able to identi identify just on morphology but everything I've, I mean, I, and I had a fair amount of osteology in, in grad school and, and uh, vertebrate paleontology, actually. And I, I just don't see, and you know, archaeologists and, and paleontologists I've talked to, that you, you really need more than just a few teeth from these different canids that, I mean, the canids that are, that are wolf or coyote or, or domestic dog. I guess ultimately you could get DNA from it because it is, it, the material is in good enough shape to get DNA. So you might be able to determine it from that. And if anybody wants to unmute and ask some questions, go for it. That was everything that was in the, um, in the chat box. Well, Jimmy Barrera says, fantastic program and thanks Steve. Thank you. I'm going to stop your screen sharing, and then that way okay. we can see everybody. All right. If anybody has any questions, go ahead and unmute yourself and ask uh, Steve, especially those of us who are going to field school, if you've got any questions about field school as well. Now I wish I'd signed up for prehistoric. <laughs> well, the youth group's going to be prehistoric, yeah. right? Oh, good. Good, 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 good. And probably right on like that paleo site that we want. You can still change, uh, Linda. <laughs> we'll see. <laughs> yeah, I don't. I don't know how much you all have, know about the historic excavations, but it's it can be um, pretty interesting because it's on a, on a fifth, probably sixth generation now uh, on ranch of uh, early Cooper County. Family dates back almost to the mid 1800s, oh. and I think it was really uh, the first the first Anglos that actually owned it uh, from from the state. And um, there are some legends of Comanches out there, but they're just legends. But as far as the actual archaeology in the ground, the focus is going to be some, on some structures that were were there in the late 1800s and early 1900s. Oh, that sounds really interesting. Hmm. Oh, and an ancient, ancient, but a, uh, an old, just the remains of an old dirt tennis court, which also dates to about 1920. Really? This was a, th I mean, you can, you know, basically this area, this, this, this ranch was developed before there were automobiles, it was still horse and buggy days. 
And Kerrville was a long, long ride. Uh, I think this is about nine, maybe 10 miles from Kerrville. So it wasn't something you got to in a few minutes. And so it became somewhat of a little community center for ranches around the area. And so they, they built this, uh, this tennis court in the later years, in the 1920s. There was the schoolhouse there, I think it was early, the late, very latest 1800s. And, um, and then there was one other structure, and I can't remember what that other structure is, but, uh, but some of the foundations are still there, but the buildings aren't. And that's the point as to what, what's in the subsurface. That's never been um, investigated. Hmm. Sounds exciting. Hmm. Well, if nobody has any other questions, um, I'd like to thank Steve for this terrific program. Really terrific. Now I can't wait to yeah. see Bill. Thanks, Steve. Yeah, great Steve. program, Steve. Yeah, we'll we, see you my, my pleasure. And I did have a question before. Someone, uh, John Benedict, asked if we if we had taped it, and it is going to be. We live streamed it into our YouTube channel mm -hmm. and. And uh, is it up now or do you have to? Okay, so it's on our YouTube channel right now. So you can see it and share it right now. Thank you all.